working today. We'll find out. They told me, I, Caden gave me the combination in case it does what it did last week. If I can remember it, I don't know. We'll see. Hopefully we don't need that. Uh, Revelation 1, I need to want to walk you through uh, what we're looking at, do a real quick review and get you up to where we are today, if I could. We're looking at John's vision that is given to him here in chapter 1. It was given to him while he was on the island of Patmos. Whenever he was in the spirit, he was carried ahead to a future time uh, and able to see things that are yet future. But in the beginning of this, at, at this vision that's being described right here, he is permitted to be able to see Jesus Christ in all of his glory. I've told you over and over again, I'm going to give it to you one more time. There's no other passage of scripture like this. It's very special because whenever we read through the gospels, we see Christ in his humility. Here we see him in all of his glory. We see him described here like we don't see him described any other place. And so it's a great privilege to be able to look at John's vision. And it starts really in verse 12 is where it starts at. But let me walk you through a few things that we've talked about. We've looked at the position of Christ in the vision. It says in the, in the text that, that we've been through that he was in the middle of seven golden candlesticks. And verse 20 of the chapter describes the, or interprets the candlesticks for us and tells us that the candlesticks are the seven churches and, the, and seven being the number of completion and perfection they illustrate or they, they are symbolic of the true church of Jesus Christ from that day through even today. So in, the, in Jesus being in the midst, it shows that he is in the midst of his church. So if we take that thought further, then we can understand that the vision that John sees here and that he shares with us as we look at Jesus in the midst of those seven golden candlesticks, it is also a picture of the present ministry of Jesus Christ. We looked at that too. That's what we're looking at. And as we came through, we saw Jesus serving as our great high priest in the way that he was dressed. He had a garment down to the foot. He had a golden sash about his chest. And so he had the, the garments of the high priest on because he is our great high priest. And we broke that down a little bit, and we've seen that as our great high priest, he's interceding for you and I. That's, what, that's his present ministry. Here's something to back it up. Hebrews 7, 22 through 25 says this, By so much was Jesus made a surety. Now, those, that bracket there is mine. I wanted you to understand what the word surety means. It's God's personal guarantee. Let me read it that way. By so much was Jesus made God's personal guarantee of a better testament or a better covenant, better than the old covenant, because the old covenant could never take away sins. The blood of bulls and goats could never wash away sins. But this covenant that Jesus has ratified with his blood is a much better covenant because the blood of Christ washes away our sins. And God says this, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more under this new covenant, under this better covenant or this better testament. Now, the guarantee of that is this. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who came here, was nailed to a cross. He lived 33 years, was nailed to a cross. There he died for our sins. He was taken from the cross. He was placed in the tomb. And on the third day, he rose again, and he is alive forevermore. So listen to this. He is the personal guarantee for you and I that we are forever the children of God whenever we accept him as our Savior. Watch, I'll go on. And they truly were many priests. That's in the Old Testament. There were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. The Old Testament priests continued to die. They only lived however many years and they died. And then they had to have a new priest. Verse 24, but this man, Jesus Christ, because he continueth ever, because he's resurrected, and he'll never die again. Watch this. Hath an unchangeable priesthood, wherefore he is able also to save them, that's you and I that know him as Savior, to the uttermost. To, to make it real clear there, that means completely. The coming of God by him, 
Here's how. Seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them or for us. So as our high priest, he is interceding for us. John went on and he said whenever he described his outward appearance here in the vision, that his head and his hairs were white like wool. They were white. It spoke of two different things. It, number one, it spoke of wisdom. So we can see that Jesus is providing wisdom for his church. You and I are told in James chapter 1 that if we lack wisdom, that we can go and we can ask God for the wisdom that we need that gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. But we are to ask in faith. In other words, we're to trust him. Whenever we're looking for wisdom, we're to trust him. But he's there to give us the wisdom we need as we pass through this world. Number three, he's purifying his church. The whiteness spoke of purity. We talked about that. He runs us. He takes us sometimes through the furnaces of affliction in life to burn away the dross, to burn away that which is not needed in our lives or that which sticks to us as we pass through the world. So he's constantly purifying. That's why sometimes in life the path becomes very difficult. That's part of the process. Remember what we talked about. God is like a silversmith. And he controls the thermostat. He turns the heat up or he turns the heat down, but he will never allow it to become so hot that it jeopardizes the integrity of that which he wants to purify. And whenever it's done, the way that he knows it's done is that he can, the silversmith can see his reflection in the silver. That's the ultimate purpose that God, for God taking us through the furnaces of affliction so that in us people will see Christ. So he's, he's interceding for us. He's given us wisdom. He's there to give us wisdom. He purifies us. As we go through life, last week we looked at this one. He identifies with his church. I can't help turn around. I don't trust this thing. I got to keep looking back. I need a little rearview mirror right here. Maybe I could, some one of the guys could get it, like a bicycle rearview mirror right there. It'd be great. Uh, but anyhow, he identifies with his church. That was the, we've seen that in the fact that, that his feet were like fine brass, like it had been burned in a fire. Jesus knows, you know, we, back to that previous point right there, he's purifying his church, and sometimes he takes us through the furnaces of affliction. And you've got to understand this, that he identifies with us because he himself went through the furnaces of affliction. I love what the writer of Hebrew writes, Hebrews writes on that. We didn't get to see it on the screen last week, so I'm going to show it to you. He said this, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that, by, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him. It, it was just like God. That's what that means. Just, just like God, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons into glory to make the captain, that, the captain of their salvation. That's Christ. He's the captain of our salvation. And then it says this, he made him perfect through sufferings. It wasn't that Jesus was imperfect. That's not what that means by any means. He was morally perfect whenever he came into this world. But whenever it says that he became perfect through sufferings, it means this. He became perfect in experience. He walked, the, he walked through the fires. He walked through the high waters. He endured the furnace of affliction. He endured the high pressures of life. Remember last week we talked about in the garden of Gethsemane, the night before he was crucified, that Satan squeezed him so hard he squeezed the blood out of the pores of his skin. That's pressure. So whenever you and I are in the high pressure times, he can identify with us. He knows exactly what we're going through as we go through this world. Now, I'm about to get you to where we're at today, but before I do, I want to set you up for this. I want you to think about something. God is saved. If you know Christ as your Savior, God has saved us, not just to come here and absorb everything that we can and then go back and just kind of live in our own little worlds. God has saved us, and now we are members of his family, but we're also members of his military. We are soldiers. I've often said this, the church here is a barracks. This is a barracks. And in a barracks, soldiers are trained. 
this is a training ground for those that know Christ as Savior to come here. My job is to take the Word of God, to teach you the Word of God, so that you will be equipped for the battle. So many times we want to get comfortable in life and we're content to drift through and, and say, you know what, I'm saved and I got an eternal home and that, that's, that's good enough for me. But I want to tell you something, it's not good enough for God. We can make a difference. We can make a difference. I, I watched the inauguration the other day, bits and pieces of it through studying at the same time. And, and, and I'm looking and, and I went back and I looked at the protests that went on in D.C. after that. And, I'm, and I, I said in the prayer, we live in a nation that's divided right down the middle. I mean, it's just split right straight down the middle. There is no man that we can put in as president of the United States that is going to heal that. There is no man that we can put in as vice president of the United States that is going to heal that. There is a man that will fix that. His name is Jesus Christ. He's the one. Listen, our problem in our nation is in the heart of the people. That's the problem. You, They can get in, they can go to D.C. and they can... They can pull out the Constitution, and I love it. But the Constitution only works for those that have a moral basis in their life. That's the only way it works. If you've got people that are immoral, it doesn't mean anything to them. You can't legislate morality. You can't draw up a law that says, okay, you're going to act this way. It's not going to work because the heart of people is, are, is corrupt and wicked and deceitful. And so the only thing that is going to change our world is Jesus Christ. That flips it back on us. We have the responsibility because we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We have within us the greatest message that has ever been proclaimed. And it's not a presidential speech or anything like that. It's very simple. It is the message that Christ came out of, out of God's love. He came into this world he died for the sins of the world he was buried and he rose again and he is alive forevermore and he's coming back and if you accept him as your savior he'll change your life that's what the world needs to know and apart from that you're not going to see people change people need to be listen to me listen to me transformed not reformed i can get a whole bunch of well i don't know if i could i'll just use this illustration i can get a whole bunch of people to march in a line and wear a certain kind of uniform that is that is reformation we need transformation that comes listen to me that comes when people hear the gospel so that you know what that does that throws it back on me i can sit back and i can complain about our nation all i want to but the the whole deal is this that it throws it back on me now somebody would say this yeah but pastor that's kind of frightening because whenever you speak up about Christ, you don't know what's going to happen. I'll, I'll, I'll say you're right. You don't know what's going to happen. That brings me to where we're at today. And I want you to listen real close to what we're going to talk about today. Point number five, here's what he does. He empowers his church. He empowers his church. I'm going to show you two verses. Two, we're going to kind of dissect some things here. Watch verse 15. I'll read this verse, and I'll point something out for you. Verse 15 of Revelation 1. And his feet like undefined brass, as if they burned in a furnace. Now, here's what I want you to notice. And his voice is the sound of many waters. Hold on to that for a second. Jump down to verse 16 now. And he had in his right hand seven stars. We'll come back to that in a moment, then the next point. And, okay, here's what I want you to see. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword okay now just hang on for a second you got out of his mouth his voice sounds like the sound of many waters it john described it as a trumpet earlier in this vision but here it's the sound of many waters and then he goes on and he says out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword so i stop and i think about this okay this is a picture of jesus in the midst of of the church and this is a picture of his of his ministry in the church so what does this mean to me uh, and there's a lot of ways we could have went with this but i'm going to give it to you this way 
the, the, the sound of his voice being as many waters would speak of power. I'll get back to that. So that's talking about his, listen to me, his word. Then in verse 16, the fact that out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. That speaks, listen to me, of his word also. But in that sense, it speaks of the effectiveness of his word. So I'm going to look at both of these. And you say, well, I don't know if I get that. You'll get it here in just a second. So let me, let me just show you something. Let me walk you through something. Let me show you the power of his word, first of all. He says that its voice is as the sound of many waters. You ever been close to a stream or close to a river whenever the water is very, very high? It's extremely powerful. If a, if a river is high and, or just if the, the current is racing by, you're not going to be able to walk across that stream because it's going to sweep your feet out from underneath you. This past year, my wife and I stood at the top of the, of the falls at the, at the Yellowstone Grand Canyon, right at the overlook, and right there, like at the bottom of the steps, the water rushed and went down over the falls. And it was, I don't know how deep it was, but the force of that water was incredible, extremely, extremely powerful. That whenever I think about God's word being powerful, and I think about Jesus right here, there's something that comes to my mind. Let me show you something. Let me walk you through a few verses, then I'll get to where I'm going. Ephesians 6, 11 through 17. Set what I just said aside for a second. Come back here. Here's what Paul writes. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and watch the end. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now listen to this. We have been given one weapon for the battle. One. That's it. The weapon is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It is far more powerful than what you and I can ever begin to imagine. When spoken into an individual's life, you and I don't understand how powerful the Word of God can be to be able to get in and to be able to change the lives of individuals. I thought this, where could I go in God's Word to show you the power of it? And, and I came across, there was something that entered into my mind. So let me take you back to a place. I want to take you back to the the Garden of Gethsemane, the night that Jesus was arrested. And I want you to, I want, just follow along, watch this. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place. He knew the Garden of Gethsemane, for Jesus oftentimes resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers, from the chief priests and the Pharisees. Now, just hold on. That's a group of about a 1,000 plus he takes to arrest Christ. Come thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and saith, or said unto them, Whom seek ye? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas, Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. Now, watch this. And as soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, watch what happened. They went backward and fell to the ground. Now watch this. The power of God's word leveled a thousand Roman soldiers that quick. Three words, I am he. That shows you the power of his word. That's what that's there for, to demonstrate to us the power of the word of God. 
So listen, we have been given this weapon. We often wonder this, what, what am I going to do? You know, what, what difference am I going to make? Or how am I going to make a difference in the world in which we live in today? We go out into the world and we share the, the truth of God's word with people. We, we start out our day this way. God, give me opportunity. Somehow, some way today, give me an opportunity to be able to share the truth of your word with somebody. Just, I challenge you to pray that. Starting this week, just start that every morning. God, give me an opportunity to share your word, to speak truth into an individual's life. You think it won't make a difference? Watch Romans 1.16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. Listen to me. There, just stop on that statement. There is no greater power. There is no greater power in the world, in the universe, in all creation, there is no greater power than the power of God. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. There isn't anything that can compare to the power of God. God's word releases that power. It releases that power. We have been given a weapon that is extremely powerful. You don't, you, listen, we, we could walk into the middle of a crowd and you speak the word of God. You think it's not powerful. Just walk into the middle of a, a crowd and begin to proclaim the name of Christ and watch what happens for this reason. Number two, it's effectiveness. It's effectiveness. Come on back here to verse 16 again. Let me show you this. It's very powerful and it's very effective. Watch verse 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp, two-edged sword. Why is it two-edged? Why is that not, why is it got to be a two-edged sword? Let me tell you why. Listen to what I'm going to tell you. It cuts both ways. That's why. It cuts both ways. To some, it convicts and condemns. To others, it convicts and converts, but it cuts both ways. And sometimes whenever people are cut with the, with the sword of the Spirit, whenever it's spoken into their lives, they don't like it. And so there is a pushback. There is a resistance. There is a, an attempt to try to silence that. Let me just say this. I don't want to get too far off the path, but... You may not realize this, but I'm going to just kind of open your eyes on something. That's what political correctness is all about today. It's what it's all about. It's a spiritual attack against the church. Because the, the world does not want us to be able to proclaim the truth of God's word. Because it makes people uncomfortable. It convicts them. They need to be convicted. They need to hear the truth. But sometimes it convicts them, and because they suppress it, then it condemns them. But you've got to understand, on the flip side of that, there are many that are convicted and converted, okay? But the world despises anything that speaks out and cuts into them verbally, and the Word of God is the power of God unto salvation. And so whenever the Word of God is spoken, people, uh, many people despise that. Let me show you something else. Hebrews 4.12 for the word of God is quick. That means it's alive. Whenever you, listen to this, when you go out and you speak the words of this book, you're speaking words that are alive. It's not like quoting from something that Shakespeare wrote. No, no, no. When you speak out of this book, when you speak the words of this book into somebody's life, you understand this, the word of God is alive. It is alive. It is God's word that is alive today. It's quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Watch this. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Somebody would say, what? what's that mean? It divides asunder the soul and the spirit. I, I think this, listen to me. That's put there to show us how sharp the sword is. You and I can't even distinguish between the soul and the spirit. You and, that, you and I can't even begin to distinguish between the two. The word of God is so sharp 
that it can divide between the soul and the spirit. Watch this. And the joints and the marrow. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It goes right down deep into the heart of individuals. That's why you get so many different responses from the word of God. But you got to understand, it's powerful. That's what the, the voice of, as the sound of many waters, extremely powerful. It, it, is, it is effective because it's pointed out. It's like a sharp two-edged sword. It's effective. It'll, it'll convict people. You think it's not powerful. Whenever Jesus returns, in, I believe it's in Revelation 19, and, and Satan's got all these troops that are gathered against him in his return. It's going to be the, by, the, by his word that he's going to destroy those people. Listen to me. It is extremely effective. Watch this one. Isaiah 55, 10 and 11. As for, for as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be. Okay, now, the, he uses the analogy in verse 10 to say, you know, just like rain falls out of the sky and, 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 and snow out of the sky and it produces it's, it, it, whenever it falls, it's got a purpose for falling. It brings forth bud, and, and, it, and it gives seed to, uh, seed to the sower and bread to the eater. In the same way, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. Amazing. What a promise. But it shall accomplish that which I please. It shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Listen to me. We don't give God enough of a chance. When we speak the word of God, whenever we are given an opportunity and we can speak it into somebody's life, God says it'll never return void. Will you give it, you deliver it, I'll use it. It's like, it's like seed. You know, you, you got a handful of seed and, and you walk around and, and you got people that are starving and you take that, those, that big handful of seed and you stuff it in your pockets. You see, I don't see any results. You're not going to while it's in your pockets. You get it out of your pocket, you take it, and you cast it on the ground. What happens? Eventually, it's going to start to grow. We're the same way with the Word of God. We have the answers for the world. We know what the world needs, but a lot of times we keep it tucked in our, in our pocket of our heart, and we don't do anything with it. We don't proclaim it to the world around us we're given god will open up a door for us to be able to speak the word of god and we find ourselves saying this you know what i'd say something but they won't listen anyhow oh hold on just a second let me go back here god says you speak it it won't return to me void it'll accomplish that which i please and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto i sent it i'm going to say this you speak the word of god something's going to happen now somebody might be convicted and and condemned by that but listen God's still using it the Spirit of God is still using his word because it's alive it is alive it is powerful it's sharper than any two-edged sword so let me get you back to the to the point again he empowers his church we are empowered we are given the Word of God which is alive it is it is sharp and it's like a two-edged sword it's like the, the, the voice of Christ was as the sound of many waters. It's as powerful as the raging waters. We got to go out and we got to speak it. And, and that brings me back to another thing. People say this, yeah, but my goodness, today? You want us to speak the word of God? God wants us to speak that today? You know what the, the, the response to that might be? And I say, I know. I've seen that response before. I've seen people that get furious because the word of God is spoken. That brings me to the next thing. Verse 6. He protects his church. Let me say this before I go any further. You and I do not have to fear going out into the world and speaking the truth of God's word. Because you want to know something? He protects us. I'm going to show you that. Watch if you would verse 16 again. And he had in his right hand seven stars. 
Now just stop right there for a second. Jump down to verse 20. Uh, uh, you'll see what the stars are here. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars of the, are the angels of the seven churches. So, okay, now we know what the stars are. They are the angels of the seven churches. But there's a lot of differences of opinion about what who those angels are because the word angel there means messenger it means messenger so some people say this that god takes and holds in his right hand listen to this it's a it's so important to understand that he's holding the stars in his right hand not the left hand he's got them in the right hand you want to know why it's the hand of power it's the hand of power and so a lot of people say, well, those are the messengers of the churches, and therefore they are the pastors of the churches. And he holds the pastor, and he gives him the power in, within the churches. And I say, I love that thought. The think that God holds me in his hand, and, and, and it's in his hand of power. And, and, and I love that. And, and in, a, in a sense, that is true. But listen, he holds every one of us, doesn't he? He holds every one of us. So I'm not so sure that's the proper interpretation. Let me give you something else to think about. Let's keep it in the book of Revelation for a second, because that's the context. In the book of Revelation, God often works through angels. So maybe, maybe this, maybe there is an angel that is assigned to every true church that exists within the world today. And, and I could back that up. And I could point you to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Watch this. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? He didn't say it to any of them. And then he says this, are they not, are not the angels all ministering spirits? Here we go. Sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. Hmm. So they are ministering spirits. So maybe maybe they are angels that he holds in his hand and they have the power and they watch over the church my favorite thought on this and i'm going to give this to you comes from a man by the name of john phillips i want you to listen to what he says and i love this thought he says this angels represent the highest power under god they represent the highest power. And so because he holds them in his right hand, the hand of power, it shows us this, that he, our Lord, has control over the highest known powers in the spiritual world or in the physical world. You got that? that they are symbolic of the highest known powers and he has control over all the power that is under him and so therefore he protects his church and there is nothing from the spiritual world or from the physical world that can come in and can harm us unless he permits that to happen it kind of reminds me let me take you back to matthew for a second matthew 16 15 through 18 watch this he saith unto them, unto his disciples, But whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter. Now be careful here. And upon this rock, now he says, You're Peter, and he points back to himself. Because Christ is the rock. Peter is a stone. Christ is the rock. The church is not built on Peter, it's built on Christ. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You wanna know why? Because he is in control of every power that would ever come against you and I. Every single power that would ever come against you and I he has control over that power. Remember this about the refining, the silversmith. It's the silversmith, he controls the heat. 
as the protector. He controls any forces that would come against you and I. So listen to this. So we can take the message, which the word of God, which is, which is powerful and it's very effective. And we can take that and we can go out in the world and we don't have to worry. We don't have to worry about the attacks that are going to come against us because he's going to protect us. Watch this. Let me refresh your memory on something. Job 1, 8 through 10. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there's none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Mm. Listen to me. There is a hedge of protection that is around every one of God's people. He controls, has control over all the spiritual forces that would come against us. Remember this, it's a spiritual battle that we're in. We don't fight against flesh and blood. We fight against spiritual forces. He controls every spiritual force attack that would ever come against you and I. They can only get as far as what he permits them to come. Remember back to that whole deal. Remember whenever Peter was going to deny him and he announced that and, and Jesus said, Satan hath desired you, Peter, that he can sift you like wheat. He had to come to, to the Lord and he had to ask him permission to get Peter. Do you know this, that before there can be an attack against you, it has to go through him. It's got to go through him. And so you and I don't have anything to fear because we have this hedge of protection that's about us on every side. Now, I know this. Some people say, well, what is the protection? And I've showed it to you before, but there's people that are here now that weren't here whenever we looked at that protection. So I want to show it to you. I want to give you a picture of that protection. What is the protection that is around me? What is the hedge? If Satan could see it or he wouldn't have said that. It's got to be something that exists because when God said to Satan, look at Job, Job said, yeah, but look at the hedge. So it was something that was visible to Satan that encompassed Job. But what was it? Now, just hold that for a second. I'm going to take you back in the Old Testament here in a bit. To, into the life of a man by the name of Elisha. He took over after Elijah was caught up in the whirlwind. Elisha was a prophet of God. And back then they had, they had what I'll call prophets in training that often traveled with the prophets. Elisha is going to be hunted down by the king of Syria. The king of Syria is going to send a military to bring Elisha back to him. And Elisha is, is hiding in a town. I believe the town's name is Dothan, but I'm not for sure. But, but they're hiding in, they're in this town. They're, they're just staying in this town. And, and he's got this young man with him that he's training. Let me pick it up. 2 Kings 6, 14 through 17. Therefore sent he thither, that's the king of Syria, sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night, and they compassed the city about. They, they're, they're all around, and like I said, I believe it's Dothan. But Elisha and that young prophet in training, they're in the city, and, and they come by night. They come in the darkness, and they encompass the city. Verse 15. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early, he gets up in the morning, and he's going forth, behold, a host compass, compass the city both with horses and chariots. He looks out the window of where they're staying, and he sees all these horses and these chariots of the Syrian army. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? What are we going to do? We don't stand a chance against these. And verse 16, and Elisha speaks. And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed, watch this. 
and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes, open the eyes of the prophet in training that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw, and behold, watch this. The mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about a hedge, round about Elisha. You want to know what the hedge is? Right here, you get a glimpse of it, it and you get a picture of it. It is a heavenly host, a heavenly army that encompasses God's people. There is that very same hedge around you and I. Today, right now, listen to me. As we meet here, you can't see it, and I can't see it. But there is a hedge about this church today. It is made up of a heavenly host. It is made up of chariots that are of fire and horses. And they are here to protect you and I today. They go with you wherever you are. You have that protection. That's why, listen to me, going back to this being empowered with the word of God, given that which is so powerful and that which is so effective in, in needing to go out in the world, we, what do we got to fear? You say, but I'd like to be able to see that with my own eyes. You're not going to. But that's why we're called to walk by faith and not by sight. We read it in God's word. We, we see what God says. We, we know what Satan said. Satan was able to see something in the life of Job. He said, there's a hedge there. So we go to Elisha's life and we see the hedge that, that the chariots of fire round about Elisha, all around. There's that hedge of protection. We see that. We bring that back. We say, that's the protection that's around me in you in our lives. So let me pull all this together. So we have God's word that is powerful and effective. We have the hedge which offers the protection. So there's no reason why you and I can't step out in faith. There's no reason why you and I, tomorrow morning, whenever you pray, and I hope you do, that you say, God, open a door today. Give me an opportunity to be able to speak into someone's life. There's no reason why as we serve him and that we have that window of opportunity entrusted to us that we can't speak it. Let me run you through a few verses here and then I'll let you go home. Deuteronomy 24, for the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. We are not alone. Watch this one. Joshua 1, 5 and 6a. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage. One more. Romans 8, 31, 32. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also give us, freely give us all things? There is not one reason why we need to fear. As we leave this building today and we step out into the world, maybe there's somebody in your family and you just, you need to, they need to hear the word. They need to hear the truth. And you need to speak the truth into their life. And you're thinking this, well, I might offend them. And they might not come back and see me. Listen, let me just say this to you. I'd rather speak the truth into somebody's life and see them offended and never come back then I would keep my mouth shut and not say anything. And whenever it comes to the great white throne judgment someday in Revelation chapter 20, and I'm standing by the Lord and I'm looking over at the unsaved and they're standing in that line. And I don't think this would be the case, but can you imagine somebody standing there and then looking up at you and I and saying this, why didn't you tell me? I would much rather offend somebody and try to win them to Christ. You say, yeah, but you got to lay the groundwork. You got to be so careful. Really? You're going to lay the groundwork for how many years or how many months? And how do you know that the appointed day to die is not going to come before you get the groundwork laid and you don't even get to speak it into their life? 
you may be the one that God has called, only one, to speak it into their life. It's on you, and it's on me. I'm not just talking to you. I got, it's the same thing on me. But we don't have to be afraid. The only, we don't have to fear. We don't have to back down. That's the enemy intimidating us, and we can't, we can't let that happen. We can't let political correctness silence the church. It's ridiculous. We have been commissioned by the creator of the world. There's no higher commission than that. I don't care what D.C. says. There is no higher commission. And someday I'll, I'll be held accountable to God, not to D.C., not to the press, not to anybody. So it's my responsibility. I have been empowered. I have, I'm given the word of God, the weapon that I need. I go out. I share that with people. I know this. It's powerful. It's effective. And I know that I got his protection. Does that mean I won't endure some pressure? Not at all. Not at all. There might be pressure. There might be a high price to be paid, too. But that's okay. Because we're doing what our Creator called us to do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Today, for what is laid out here, Lord, there's so much, so many different ways we could go with this text. But Lord, we're able to see the that which came out of the mouth of our Savior was powerful and effective. It's his word. It's his word, and it's entrusted to the church. So we have this powerful, effective weapon to be able to go out into the world. But, Father, forgive us, because there are times we're terrified to speak up. We get intimidated by sinners, people that are of a strong personality. We allow them to intimidate us. Father, help us to understand. Picture in our minds that hedge of protection that's there with us. It is that angelic force. It is that heavenly host that encompasses us wherever we go. And then, Father, give us the boldness to speak up. Let us do it in love not abrasive, but give us the boldness and let it speak the truth directly into the lives of people. Father, I pray that for this message today. As this seed is cast out, might you use it. Don't let us just be hearers of your word. But let us go out and do something with what we've heard today. There is such a need in our society for the truth of your word to be proclaimed. So, Father, I entrust this to you. I know this, what we looked at this morning in Isaiah 55. Your word never returns void. So, Lord, I cling to that promise today, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, for that. Incur for that. Incur for that. Incur for that. Incur.